I'm Mason President Gregory Washington, welcoming you to our Future Transformed, a series of conversations with Mason's leading experts about solutions to the grand challenges of today and tomorrow. Joining us is Lori Robinson, Professor Emeritus at Mason and former Clarence J. Robinson Professor of Criminology, Law, and Society. The two-time former assistant U.S. Attorney General is here to talk to us about building greater trust between law enforcement and citizens and applying science to policing. Welcome to the program. Thank you. After Michael Brown was killed by police in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014, you were appointed by President Barack Obama as co-chair of the White House Task Force on 21st Century Policing. So the task force made 59 recommendations for police reform, and it had a significant impact. As your own research showed, 40% of the nation's largest police departments changed their training and use of force policies in the two years after the report's release. And so that was a significant outcome. Um, why then did you and Charles Ramsey reconvene the task force in 2023? Uh Mr. President, we reconvened the group in early February this year uh, after the tragic death of Tyree Nichols in Memphis uh, because we felt that despite all of the uh, police departments around the country that have made changes based on our report and other recommendations, that there has not been enough broad action uh, from what we would call the whole of government and the whole of communities right. to address this, that, that there are still many things, including problems of poverty, of racism, of, of systemic society-wide issues that need to be addressed. And we thought, oh, Let's get the wise heads on our task force together and see what we can do to address these issues. This is really interesting that you would say that. So talk a little bit about what did the evidence say? So you convene this yes. entity in 2014, yep. have this tremendous impact, have change, real change. Yep. Then you reconvene in 2023. Did the evidence substantiate that there had been no change or that things had gotten worse, or that things had gotten better? Well, th that's, that's a really good question. Uh, we have a lot of evidence that within police departments that, adopt, that uh, any number of them have adopted particular suggestions of changes in policy and practice that we recommended. They've eliminated chokeholds, they've changed no-knock warrants, They've done particular things and changed use of force policies, as you alluded to, just to cite some specific examples. But what we had not reckoned with, I think, sufficiently was the setting in which they, the police departments are operating. Uh, and what needs to happen is a what we call whole of government and whole of community approach to recognize that where you have communities facing a lot of poverty uh, and facing a systemic racism from the past, as an example, uh, that, that there is a natural conflict there if they feel there's over-policing and harm occurring from that. So does this task force have an official status? Well, that's a, a really good question. No, we had no official status. However, interestingly, the Domestic Policy Council in the White House has not once but twice asked us for briefings. In fact, we just did one yesterday. Outstanding, outstanding. Mm -hmm. So my understanding is there are eight recommendations, and of the eight, which is the most important? Well, the first one is actually the most important because it talks about the need to change the mission of policing from simply reducing crime uh, to a broader one of community safety. 
that is a significant outcome, uh, to yeah. say the least, right? Because it kind of changes the fundamental mission yes. of, uh, uh, of the police force. Right, and it has to be done in concert with the entire community okay. and in concert with education and public health and housing, et cetera. Now, the report does not lay all the blame on police practices, right? right. You, you call for addressing the underlying drivers of crime yes. and call on the federal government to support community-based organizations and local and state governments yes. in creating safe communities. Yes. Even so, why do you believe the nation remains, as the task force report says, stuck when it comes to fixing policing? Well, there are some other issues involved here. And one of the most significant ones, and we address this in the report, is the culture of policing. Uh, and we do talk in, in the report about the need to address the, that culture, um, that the culture needs to be one much more about uh, a culture of guardians, guardians of the community rather than warriors. I mean, there's a, a place for warrior culture, which is if you're dealing with terrorists, dealing with a violent drug gang, but, but the essence of the culture has to be about protectors of the community. And that actually goes back to Plato's vision of protectors of democracy. So that's one point. But a second point, which goes to our, the organization of our government, and that is that in our, uh, in our country, we have 18,000 police departments. We are completely decentralized in our system. Uh, and by contrast, the United Kingdom has 35 police departments. It's completely centralized, and it's all uh, you know, if they wanted in the Home Secretary's office in London to change the policy on use of force, they could issue an edict on a Friday today, and on Monday, they could have that policy issued and out and do the training on Tuesday. Um, Amazing. Yes. You once said, as it relates to crime, that the more we rely on evidence rather than just emotion, the greater the positive impact we will have. What do you mean by that? I'll go back, uh, Mr. President, to, to just uh, a quick anecdote about when I was first working uh, in criminal justice. I was working for the American Bar Association many decades back when I was a young person coming into the field. And I went to cover a hearing in the US Senate about criminal justice, and I thought, I'm really going to learn a lot from what the senators raised. It was about the federal criminal code and about reforms. And I sat there, I was taking notes and really excited about what I would learn. And one senator said to the other, well, here's what I think we should do. And he said, my brother-in-law once had a case and the such and such and such and such. And I thought, is that the way they come to make decisions because of some random case that came up? And I've always remembered that, even though it was many decades back. And it made me start really thinking about how do we come to policy decisions? And from that, and obviously over a number of years, I really focused more and more on how we make decisions and the importance of evidence and research and science in informing both policy and practice in criminal justice. And when I was in the Justice Department later with Janet Reno during the Clinton administration, and then with Eric Holder in the Obama years, I made this connection between science and policy and practice a, a high, very high priority. And particularly in the Obama administration, Eric Holder was a very big supporter of this initiative with me. And we set up a What Works Clearinghouse in the Justice Department that still exists today so that practitioners, whether it's police or judges or probation officers or anyone else, can just go there, or students here at Mason, 
to say what works in addressing uh, domestic violence or what works in reducing juvenile justice recidivism and find out what we know from research. Professor Robinson, thank you for sharing your insights. Thank you, Mason Honor College students. And thank you all for joining us for Our Future Transform.